Stand with me, if you would, please. Reading from Luke chapter 17. Beginning in verse 20, it says, Being asked of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. This is God's infallible word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the, Lord, all the things we've been singing about. Thank you for fact that you are our strength. And Lord, help us again this morning in, in the pages of your word, in the, in, in the reading of it, in the interpretation of it, in the application of it, to find the strength there for this week and beyond. Lord, we're, we, we know that any one uh, service, any one message uh, will probably be quickly forgotten. We pray that the cumulative, the cumulative uh, 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 building up of your word into our lives will in fact make the changes over time that will make us more like Christ, build our desire to be like you. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated and uh, turn with me to Luke 17. If you have your own Bible, which I trust you do, um, we, we, by the way, I don't make, mention this often, but we use the English Standard Version. There are other great English versions. Uh, we use that one as kind of the best, I think, compromise between closeness to the original languages and readability. So uh, the ESV is our scripture of choice, but uh, yes, the uh, NIV, New American Standard Bible, the, in fact, I love the King James because uh, I grew up on it, and so I remember so much of the Bible from that, but all great translations as well. But if you, pray, I pray that, I trust that you have your own, that you can come, that you can make notes, that you can follow. I, I, I trust that you're reading ahead as we go through the book of Luke, that you're absorbing yourself in the scripture and uh, coming, figuring out what you didn't know, asking questions. If you don't get what I'm saying, which could very well be possible, try and explain it. We want to know the word of God. We want to be we want to be people who are absorbed with the Word of God, saturated with it. That's what will change our lives. So we're in Luke 17, and we come to this passage talking about the coming of the kingdom. You know, before, uh, before getting bogged down in the Vietnam War, which really became his legacy, those of you who were around at the time will remember the Lyndon Johnson's dream was to create the great society. And he spent massive amounts of money originally trying to do exactly that. He naturally became the subject of the comedians of the time, one of whom was Bob Hope. Bob Hope informed LBJ of the consequences if he were to succeed in his, in his idea of removing all these social ills. He said, when we get the great society, there'll be no more pain, no tension, no headaches, no stomach acid, and no tired blood. It may be good for the country, but it's going to take a lot of the fun out of commercials. And if you were around during that time, you remember that that's what a lot of the commercials were about. Well, here's the, 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 the good news and the bad news. The good news is, beloved, the kingdom is coming. The bad news is it's not going to come through any president, contrary to what you heard last week and to what you will hear this coming week. It's not the way it's ultimately going to come. Now, we want to be faithful citizens, and we want to know how to vote and what to vote and why we're voting, and I encourage that. But the kingdom of God is something that God alone will bring. He says, there's so much mi mixed upness about this these days. We have so many people who are out building the kingdom and being encouraged to build the kingdom, and we should live by kingdom principles for sure, but God's message to his people was, I will give you the kingdom. The kingdom is coming from God, beloved. It doesn't come from us. But I'm gonna, I have some good news. There's a sense in which it's already here. Now, the, the problem is we do want it now. That's what the politics are all about these days. Jesus' message when he came to earth was repent for the what? Kingdom of God is at hand. 
He's been preaching now for three years. It was a great message. And the first century people to whom he was preaching it wanted it now. But after three years, no one was actually seeing what they thought was the kingdom. And so Luke introduces this section with this cryptic statement in verse 20, being asked of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. Now you can imagine, given the antagonism of the Pharisees toward Jesus, that this question, when they asked it, reeked of sarcasm. It was not an honest question looking for real information. What they were really saying is, listen, you've been talking about this kingdom for three years now. We want to know when's it going to happen. It's time to put up or shut up. When is this kingdom coming? There's another challenge from a hostile peanut gallery, if you will. So Jesus uses the opportunity to clarify the understanding of the Pharisees, beginning in verse 21, and then he turns to his own disciples, beginning in verse 22, and gives some clarification to them. We'll touch on both of those today, but I want to start by kind of giving a big picture of well, what is the kingdom of God all about anyway? The word kingdom means rulership. We use the kingdom that way, you know, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of this, the kingdom of that. What are we talking about? We're talking about the rulership, the government, the sovereignty in a certain area. And it's used the same way in the Bible. But there are two senses in which God rules. So two senses in which the Bible speaks of the kingdom of God. Now, most of those are the second one that I'm going to mention. That's where we'll spend our time, most of it. But there's a, and, so, and when we see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in Scripture, that's what it's talking about, the second sense in which it's used. But there's a greater sense in which it's used. There's an overarching umbrella that we need to look at first. So I want to see today the big picture, and then we'll go into more detail next week. So let's look at, first of all, the big picture, the universal kingdom of God. The universal kingdom of God. This is the broadest sense in which God's rule applies. And how broad is that? Well, it's this broad, beloved. The universal kingdom of God is the simple fact that God was, is, and always will be in charge of everything. Nothing escapes the notice of God. Nothing escapes the involvement of God. Nothing escapes the participation of God. Nothing escapes his notice. Nothing escapes his control. God is in control of absolutely everything. This is the universal kingdom of God. He has never lost control. He's never been anxious about his control. He's never been undecided about what needs to be done. He's never been perplexed. He's never rubbed his hands in despair. God has always been in complete control. This is ground zero of reality. God rules. We must get that through our minds and hearts. This is the basis of faith. This is the basis of Christian faith. God is in charge. This is one of the reasons that the most basic instruction to people in the Bible is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You don't need to fear somebody who has no rulership, who has no authority, but the one who has all authority certainly should inspire fear and reverence on our part, right? So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Verses abound in the Bible that talk about God's rulership in this sense. I'm just going to read a few. We won't turn to all of them for the sake of time, but, and, and this is just a very small smattering of, of examples. There are many, many others besides this. But how about Psalm 24, verse 1? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell in it. It all belongs to God. It's all His. Psalm 47, verse 2, For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared a great king over all the earth. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he who sits in the circle above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth, of the earth as emptiness. Listen, if you didn't think God is involved in things, what do you do with these verses? 
God will be in charge of who becomes the next president of the United States. Now, you need to vote. God will work through your vote, but God is sovereign. I told somebody this week, the thing that scares me is God usually gives people what they deserve. And when you think about where our nation has gone and is going, we should be fearful. We should be prayerful. But we should know that God is in charge. He's in complete control. Isaiah 46, verse 9, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Listen, if God is to you someone who set it all in motion, is setting aside, just kind of watching it go, you are sadly mistaken. That is not how the Bible presents God. God is intimately involved in everything that goes on. First Chronicles 29, 11, David prays, yours is the kingdom, O God. You are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. Psalm 10, verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. I mean, are you getting the point? God is in charge. You don't understand God until you get that. And you won't have a God who is big enough for your life until you get that. God is in charge of everything. His rulership is absolute. It is steadfast. It is sure. It is the bedrock of the Christian faith. The thing that is our credo is God was, is, and always will be in complete charge of everything. God rules. Okay, so I look around and I say, whoa, doesn't really look much like God is ruling. Surely all the stuff that's going on in this country and in this world doesn't please the God that I see in the Bible, doesn't look like he's in charge all the time. So why is that? Well, that's because the second point in this section is there's been a breach in the universal kingdom of God. There's been a breach in God's rulership. Why? Because God created. Because God created. And when God created, he created certain beings. And he wanted those beings to love because of the love that he has within the Trinity. God loves the Father, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Spirit, and so on. It's a love relationship that's been going on for the, forever. And so God created beings who had the ability to love, but with the ability to love comes the ability to choose. You can't be loved if you can't choose, right? And so the ability to choose brings its own possibilities, right? So men and angels that God has created have the ability to choose, and that brings with it the ability to rebel. And eventually that rebellion came. It came first in the realm of the angels, when Satan set himself up in opposition to God, and according to Re Revelation 12, looks like maybe he took a third of the angels with him in rebellion against God. It came in the realm of men with the fall in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve chose to go their own way as opposed to the way of God. And so there was a breach in the universal rulership of God. Now that raises a couple of questions. Couldn't God have just struck the rebels down right away and everything would have been just fine going forward? And if he's an omnipotent God, you can't say that he couldn't have done that, right? Second one is, did this all take God by surprise? Was he just kind of sitting there hoping that these people and these angels that he had created would love him for whom he was and that there would never be any problems that would crop up? And the answer is no, God was not taken by surprise. God is never taken by surprise. How do we know that? 1 Peter 1 tells us that before the foundation of the world, God had already created the solution to the sin problem that was going to crop up, right? Talks about Jesus. Talks about the fact that there would be a Savior that would be needed. And he talks about the fact that he was, before the foundation of the world, he had been determined. God knew everything that was going to happen, and yet he still created. Why? Why? I'll tell you what, beloved, we won't understand this perfectly in this life. We'll never understand this perfectly in this life. But in some way that we don't quite see yet, God is getting glory by everything that goes on. 
God is glorified when people use their gift of choice to choose for him in the midst of all the brokenness that has resulted as a result of the fall. God gets glory. To love and to obey God in the midst of the broken surroundings in which we live is one of the greatest acts of worship that there can ever be. God is being glorified, even by the evil that goes on in some sense. See, with this, with the, but, but the breach in the in, in, intimacy of God, which we see with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, made the relationship with God that they enjoyed no longer possible, right? God had said, in the day that you sin, you're going to die. In the day that you sin, there will be no more relationship with a holy God. And so in order for there to be a relationship with God, the Bible teaches that mediation is required. In other words, there has to be somebody who comes along and serves as a go-between. There has to be some way for a fallen, broken humanity who is now imperfect and therefore cannot relate to a perfect God. God says, I cannot look upon sin. That relationship has to be reestablished in some way by a mediator, someone who can represent man to God and someone who can represent God to man. We're lost forever without that possibility, without that mediatorship. And so beneath the overarching universal kingdom of God, the Bible introduces a second kingdom, a second sense in which God rules that we could call the mediatorial kingdom or the mediated kingdom of God. A mediated kingdom, a mediatorial kingdom where entrance is bought and paid for by the sacrifice that can bring us back, that can bring forgiveness of our sins to, into play so that we can once again be reestablished in a relationship with God, so we can have access to this God that we deserted. And the way that God chose to do that was through a mediator. That mediatorial kingdom, which is not usually the term you well, you hear it applied in theological circles, not otherwise, but it's because this kingdom has a mediator. This kingdom has someone who is serving as the go-between between between God and man. So this is the kingdom that the Bible is usually talking about when it references the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And the Pharisees, who knew their Old Testament, were looking for this kingdom. That's what they expected to see. So let's look at the mediated kingdom of God. I want to see three things about that. First of all, see that it is prophesied, that it's prophesied. In the Old Testament, the mediated kingdom of God is prophesied in many, many ways throughout the Old Testament, and it begins right away in Genesis 3. As soon as sin enters the picture, we begin to hear talk about a mediator, now, he's spoken of in Genesis 3 a little differently, but in Genesis 3, God promises that through the seed of the woman, there's going to come a redeemer, someone who can put this all back together, someone who can reestablish the relationship that was lost between God and man. So the promise is that there will be someone coming from the seed of the woman who will be able to reestablish contact and access with God. And this access is provided on the basis of a blood sacrifice that pays the price for the sin. This is one of the most basic things in the Bible, but sin must always be paid for. It always is. It's always paid for by someone. All sin is paid for by someone. Our own society teaches that. If you don't think so, just travel down Cheyenne Street at 60 miles an hour and find out if you pay the price or not, right? Sin always has to be paid for. It's the same in God's rulership. And so the, in, in God's rulership, this sin, which is, so, which is so much worse than we can ever imagine because it is the offense, again, it is a violation of the character of a perfectly holy, infinitely holy God. It must be paid for in some way and a sacrificial price is exacted. In the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, right away we see this. How do we see it? We see it in the fact that God removes the fig leaves that they used to try and cover themselves and their sin, and he gives them the 
animal skins, which means that some animals died in order to provide those. So we have, we have uh, access to God provided through the blood sacrifice of animals right there in Genesis 3, a mediator and a blood sacrifice right from the beginning. Then this theme continues all the way through the Old Testament, right? The patriarchs come to God and they have access to God. How? By sacrifices. That's what Bethel is all about. That's where Bathsheba is. It's about where these places where the patriarchs offered sacrifice to God. Same thing that Cain and Abel were doing when Cain came up short because he didn't bring a blood sacrifice. That whole thing continues, of course, and it gets formalized when we come to the time of Moses. And God gives the law through Moses. And the concept of access through a blood sacrifice is established through the Passover. And the fact that the only way the Israelites were delivered was because they chose to put the blood of a sacrificial lamb on their doorpost so that their eldest sons and daughters could be saved while those of the Egyptians were killed. The blood sacrifice. And who was the mediator of that covenant? The law that God gave? Moses was, right? He represented God to the people and the people to God. Now, he wasn't the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, he wasn't the ultimate uh, mediator. He couldn't actually save the people, but remember how he mediated. He's an example of what a mediator is and what a mediator does. If you read Genesis 32, you'll find that when God's ready to wipe the children of Israel out, because after he gives the Ten Commandments and Moses is coming down from the mountain, and it turns out they're in the midst of breaking every one of them right then and there with the orgy that was going on at the golden calf, Moses is the one who, when God says, I'm going to wipe them out, I'll save you, and you can start a new nation. Moses pleaded for them. Remember that? He's a mediator. He represented God to the people, and he represented the people to God. We see this continuing through the prophets in the Old Testament. They bring a message. Their message is that there is access to God through the blood sacrifice. And they are mediators in the sense that they speak for God to the people, and they speak for the people to God. And so the pattern continues. The idea of kingship is added in Genesis 49, 10, pretty soon after the beginning, when Jacob blesses his children when he's down in Egypt. Remember that, how Joseph was down there and he brought his father down and, and Jacob was blessing his children near the end of his life. And one of those children was named Judah and he said, he said this about Judah in Genesis 49, 10. He said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah no, the ruler's staff from between his feet. So a king is coming. That king is going to be in the line of Judah. And that promise reaches its apex in the time of David, around 1000 BC, when David becomes the king and the kingdom reaches its apex as it's been so far in history. And God makes the promise that there will be an eternal kingdom under David's reign in 2 Samuel 7 promising a greater son who will rule on his throne, not just for a while, not just for the 40 years that David ruled or the 40 years that Solomon ruled, but forever. There'll be a king on the throne of David. Even when the kingdom is, 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 is taken captive because they have gone into idolatry and the Babylonians sweep in and take Israel away, the promise is still there in Daniel 7, who was part of the captivity, and Daniel's taken into Babylon, and he, he becomes a ruler there in Babylon. But God still uses him as a prophet. In Daniel 7, you find him prophesying about a son of man who will have everlasting dominion. The kingdom principle is still established. A king, a mediator king. That's depicted a lot of ways in the Old Testament. So by the time you get to the first century, those Jews in Jesus' time were saying, well, where's the mediator king? We're looking for him. Where is the Messiah? Where is the anointed one? that has been promised. They were looking for someone who would come and save them politically and overthrow Rome and take over. But their expectations, beloved, were a little bit misguided because they only took the passages that talked about the king and the political kingship and they didn't take a lot of other passages into account. So they misunderstood what is the kingdom all about? What is God's rule all about? So the second thing we need to understand about the mediated kingdom is not only is it prophesied, but it's partitioned. It's partitioned. There are two compartments to the mediated kingdom of God. And the 
Jewish people of Jesus' time should have gotten this, but didn't. The disciples didn't get it any more than the Pharisees did, any more than anybody else in Jesus' time. Jesus took them to task for that, but they didn't understand there is a physical component to the kingdom of God, but there is also a spiritual component. And the two have to play together. The two have to come together, and that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, as they ask this question of Jesus, he is in the last six months, by this time he's probably in the last three or four months of his life on earth, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and everybody who's following has picked up, this is no ordinary trip to Jerusalem. The disciples are expecting, finally, Jesus is going to set up the kingdom. That's why the Pharisees are asking this question because they've kind of begun to suspect the same thing that this guy that they don't believe in at all but who has been preaching the kingdom of, of God is at hand. They're thinking, well, he's going to try and do this. He's going to lead a revolt against Rome. This is going to be fun to watch. And so they come to Jesus and they say, well, are you going to do it now? When are you going to set up the kingdom? And what they're trying to do is they expect that he's going to answer, yeah, now's the time I'm going to do this. They want to get him on record so that they can discredit him because that's their only interest. But what they get in answer to that question, when are you going to set up the kingdom, is a totally unexpected answer. Jesus says in verse, mid-verse 20, he says, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Whoa. It's not what they expected. I'm not going to be able to see it. What kind of kingdom is that that I can't see? It's not going to be coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there. And that comment would have been a complete surprise to the Pharisees because they thought he would at least try to do this. It was a complete surprise to the disciples because they had invested three years of their life and had committed themselves totally to the idea that this was the Messiah and that he would set up a kingdom and that he would kick the Romans out and that they would get a place in the administration of the kingdom. So here's Jesus saying, well, you're not even going to be able to observe it. Everybody is listening carefully now, I can tell you. But they hadn't understood the kingdom. They had grossly oversimplified. What they should have understood, both from the teaching of Jesus up to this time, as well as the teaching of the Old Testament, was that the kingdom is multidimensional. The kingdom is multidimensional. It has a physical component, yes. Very like their expectations. But it also has a spiritual component which is prior. God's, if you take the idea of the kingdom as being God's rulership, God's rulership has to start on the inside before it can be outward. Where would they have picked that up? Jeremiah 31. Jesus says, or the, the Bible says in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah had prophesied, for this is the co covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. He had written it on stone tablets before, but he's saying now I'm going to put it right inside them in their heart. And I will write it on their hearts. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Forgiveness is an entrance required to the kingdom. Forgiveness is part of the new covenant. Forgiveness was a, was a critical component of the kingdom. So is there a coming king like 2 Samuel 7 and Daniel 7 propose? Yes. Let's see Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and other passages that, like Jeremiah 31 also spoke about this need for forgiveness. And Isaiah 53 spoke of a suffering Messiah. Listen to this, Isaiah 53, beginning in verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the spiritual dimension to the kingdom. Had they read this passage, did they know it was there? Of course they did. 
What did they do with it? Nothing. Why? Because they didn't know what to do with it and they didn't like it. They wanted the political kingdom, but they didn't want anything to do with whatever it was that was being talked about there. So they missed the whole thing. See, Jesus' message hadn't been simply the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Jesus' message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. That implied a spiritual commitment prior to a political rulership. So what Jesus is doing here is reminding them, guys, you've missed this component altogether. The kingdom of heaven is not coming in ways that can be observed. I, I can't, you can't see what's in somebody else's heart and they can't see what's in your heart. But that's where the kingdom begins. You can't observe that. But I'm telling you, that's where it happens. The kingdom of heaven starts there. Kingdom of heaven starts with cleansed hearts resulting from genuine repentance. You can't be part of the political kingdom of God until you have become part of the spiritual kingdom of God. Until your heart is cleansed. God doesn't let uncleansed, unrepentant, unregenerate people into his kingdom. It doesn't matter whether it's just one deed or whether it's a whole raft of them. You can't go there. Repentance is the first qualification. The kingdom starts in the heart. It's coming in ways that can't be observed. Why? Because it builds from the inside out. And forgiveness that's required here has to be paid for. For us, it's repent. For Jesus, it was go to the cross and pay for it. And that's where Jesus was on his way. That's where he was going. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to establish the kingdom, but not in the way they thought. He's going to Jerusalem to pay the penalty for the sin so that those who will become part of the kingdom can be forgiven. This is the first thing that has to happen. This is prior, prior to everything else that has to happen. So there's a spiritual component that they were missing. Are you with me? That's the basic message up to this point. Now, Here's the next question. Does that mean that the political component of the kingdom, the earthly rulership of Jesus on a throne where people will see him, where it won't be a president anymore here or a premier somewhere else or a dictator somewhere else, but it will be Jesus overall? Does it mean that's not going to happen? Absolutely not. That is going to happen. All you got to do is read on, right? Look down to verse 24. Jesus has told the crowd the kingdom is not coming in ways that can be observed, back there in verse 20. Now he turns to his disciples in verse 24 and he says, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? I mean, if you're paying attention, if you're, if you're going through this passage of Scripture, you would have to be asking yourself, if you're writing down and taking notes, okay, you get to verse 20, 21, you'd say the kingdom, okay, can't be seen, can't be observed. You can't say it's here or there. Okay, so it's, so it's, so, so it's spiritual. It's in some way that I can't see it. And then you come down to verse 24, and he says, it's going to light up the whole sky. Everybody will be able to see it. Contradiction? No multi-dimensional kingdom. A kingdom that is both spiritual on the one hand and will become political on the other hand in the day when God decides it's time for all that to happen. The kingdom that can't be seen will be the kingdom that is seen by everyone. This is the promise of this passage of Scripture. The spiritual dimension, interestingly enough, has already started. When did that start? Well, that started with Jesus coming and, with, and particularly with his death and resurrection because that cleared the way for true forgiveness of sin. Now, those people in the Old Testament, were they forgiven? Absolutely. But you remember, we've seen this before. They were forgiven on credit. Their sin hadn't actually been paid for yet. The blood of bulls and goats that they offered as an indication of their faith couldn't actually pay the penalty for their sin. That happened 
when Jesus died for them, just like it happened for us when Jesus died for us. So that aspect of the kingdom that is spiritual could begin the moment that Jesus had died. That's why Jesus turned to Pilate in John 18. About verse 36, I think, and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He meant that because Pilate, for all he knew, thought he was trying to take over Rome. And Jesus said, no, you misunderstood. My kingdom is not of this world. It's otherworldly. It's spiritual. It's heavenly. My kingdom, you know what he's saying, really? My kingdom is, having, is heaven coming into the hearts of people and being lived out through them. Wow. That's the spiritual element of the kingdom of God, beloved. And that's where Jesus wants to take us and that's where we have to go if we're ever gonna be part of the eternal kingdom of God. The kingdom and all of the promises in the Old Testament will all be fulfilled, both the new covenant piece of that, the spiritual part of that, as well as the political part, all of it. Every promise of God will be fulfilled. Every promise of God is yes, right? None will go unfulfilled. All will be fulfilled, but they are at different times. You begin to see that the kingdom, let me put it this way, the kingdom of God, the mediated kingdom of God is already in the spiritual sense that the salvation is provided, the forgiveness is made available, the price has been paid. The kingdom of God is already and yet it's not yet. Two elements, two dimensions, two pieces to that puzzle, two compartments to that kingdom. They both fit together because you can't be part of the one without being part of the other. But the one starts now with the first coming of Christ. The other one starts when Christ comes again. This is what the Old Testament never was, was, was clear on and why the disciples couldn't understand. They didn't understand about the second coming of Christ, not initially. So they're looking for everything to happen now because they didn't know how to interpret the spiritual part of it. They just took the part they liked, which was the political part, and said, when are we going to take over Rome? And Jesus said, I'm not here to take over Rome. I'm here to take over your heart. So you can be here when I take over Rome and anybody else that stands in the way. This is the message that he's given. So the first dimension of this kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, was ushered in with the first coming of Christ. The second will be ushered in with the second coming of Christ. Can't wait to see that, can you? Can't wait. That's why he urges us to pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Long for this. We know we do, but it will come not through the political system, it will come through God. And that part of the kingdom, spiritual part, must begin with the repentance of our heart. That's what Jesus has been saying all along to these people. That's what he's still saying today. Kingdom is partmentalized. So it's prophesied, it's partitioned. Thirdly, it is personalized. Jesus makes one more very powerful statement here in verse 21. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, some people have struggled with that. Most commentators struggle with that. What, what exactly does that mean? Because the wording isn't completely clear. Some of your English translations, and I don't know which one you have, but some of them say the kingdom, the kingdom is in you. And it makes it sound like that's just Jesus repeating this is the spiritual element of the kingdom and it takes place in you, which would be true. But I don't think that's the interpretation that's correct here. The word in the midst of you is a translation of one Greek word and it means, and the, and the ESV has done a nice job of translating it, it means in the midst of you, physically in the midst of you. And as Jesus looks at them, I think what he's saying to the Pharisees that are there questioning is, hey, listen, let me tell you something. The kingdom is right here because the king is right here. The king you so desperately want, he's here. And because you expect it to all happen in a certain way according to your rules, you're missing it. Because you're not understanding the spiritual element of this, you're not even seeing the physical element that's standing right in front of you. They were eyeball to eyeball with the king. 
And therefore they were eyeball to eyeball with the kingdom and they missed it. When Jesus was saying the kingdom is in the midst of you, what he was saying was, listen, you guys need to know this. The seed of the woman in Genesis 3, 15, that's me. The Passover lamb from Exodus 12, that's me. The lion of the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, that's me. The only one who could keep the law of Moses perfectly so that he could be a sacrifice for sin, that's me. The greater prophet than Moses in Deuteronomy 18, that's me. The greater son of David in 2 Samuel 7, that's me. The greater than Solomon that's going to come, that's me. It's all me. Psalm 2, the one who will come as the king who is over all the earth, that's me. The suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53, that's me. It's all me. I'm right here. And you're not getting it. Because he didn't fit their mold. They had a preconceived notion how it should all be. It wasn't happening the way they thought, so they missed it all. They had grossly oversimplified. They didn't realize that the lion would also be the lamb. They didn't realize that the suffering Messiah would also be the, the reigning Messiah would also be the suffering Messiah. They didn't realize that the Son of God would also be the Son of Man. They didn't realize that the reigning Messiah would be the suffering Messiah. They didn't realize that he would be, yes, king, but he would also be prophet and priest. The anointed one. They should have known that because all of those were anointed offices in the Old Testament. They didn't get that. The apostles didn't get it then. They got it later concerning the prophetic ministry of Jesus. John later said in John 1 verse 18 that no one has seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known, speaking of Jesus. His priestly ministry was described by the writer of the Hebrews when he said in Hebrews 9, 26, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just exactly what Jesus is on his way to do even as he speaks these words. Hebrews 7, 25, consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives and makes intercession for him. Who was the him who could save to the uttermost? It was Jesus. Who were these men looking at face to face? It was Jesus. Who could have saved them from their sins and made them part of the ultimate kingdom of God? It was Jesus and they missed it. They missed it because they refused to understand their need for forgiveness. They thought they could work their way in. Didn't understand the grace of God. They only wanted the king. They didn't want the prophet. And they didn't want the priest. So I know that we've delved a little deep here today. I hope you're getting at least the, the broad outline of what Jesus is saying here. Two pieces to this kingdom. And you have to have the one, the salvation that's provided spiritually before you can be part of the next. This passage is teaching us that the mediatorial kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Already he has made atonement for sin. Already we can become part with him. Already we can have sins forgiven. We can become part of his family and we can be part of his kingdom. But there is more to come. The day when he will set up shop on this earth and will turn everything that is wrong, will turn it right. The day when he will bring the justice that we look for. The day when he will bring peace on this earth among the peoples, the day when everything will be made right. But he is the only mediator that can make peace with God. He is the God-man. This is why he needed to be both. He needed to be God so he could represent God to man. He needed to be man so he could represent man to God. And he needed to be man so he could die for our sins. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, there is one mediator between God and man. Who? the man Christ Jesus. He's the one. He's the only one through whom access to the Father can be granted. There's only one way to come in entrance to the kingdom. It was all about Jesus then. It's all about Jesus now. It will always be all about 
Jesus. Dr. David Siemens tells of a Muslim who became a Christian, an African Muslim who became a Christian. Some of his friends asked him, sometimes, you know, people that don't know as much as we do theologically know a whole lot more than we do. Somebody asked this man who had become a Christian, said, why have you become a Christian? He answered this way. He said, well, it's like this. He supposed, said, suppose you're going down the road and suddenly the road forks in two directions and you don't know which way to go. And there is at the fork of the road were two men, one dead and one alive. Which one would you ask which way to go? That's who Jesus is. He's the mediator of the new covenant. He's the one who by his blood has bought and paid for the entrance of anyone who will believe in him into the kingdom of God so that that kingdom can take root in us now and then become part of who we are when he comes again. That's the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Learn more about it as we go through this chapter and then as we get into Luke 22 and we thank you for the things that you will reveal to us. But Lord, this big picture gives us what we need simply to know how we can become part of it. We need to be part with you. You are the king. The Pharisees missed the kingdom because they missed the king. And so we do not want to miss because we missed you too. So would you please cause our hearts to open to you Cause us to see what it means to have you as the Lord and King, not just the Savior, but Lord and King of our life. Because that's really the requirement. If anyone comes after me, you said, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So here we are to say, that's what we want to do by the grace of God. In his name we pray, amen.